want Thanks. to. We're, we're, video, <laughs> we're videotaping this. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight in the rain. Of all days it has to be today. <laughs> Um, we are at Norwest Gallery. Thank you so much for coming and thank you Norwest Gallery for hosting us. This is actually my second time having a blockchain panel here, so I'm very, um, very appreciative of their generosity. Today we are talking about alternative economies. Uh, the title of the event is Rebel Detroit, New Economies, New Power, and New Futures. Uh, I really wanted to, uh, well, before I, I explain all of that, I'll quickly introduce our panelists. We have B. Anthony on the end. B. Anthony Holly is a community activist, educator, entrepreneur, and artist born and raised in Detroit. B. Anthony is a co-founder of Conscious Community Cooperative Think Tank, a grassroots self-sufficiency organization which provides awareness programs to the community connecting cooperative economics, emergency preparedness, sustainability, and holistic health. And then we have Bryce Detroit with that beautiful baby. Um, Bryce Detroit is the Afrofuturist teller, storyteller, activist, and pioneer of entertainment justice. As a cultural designer, he is a national award-winning music producer, performer, and curator. A prominent community active advocate Bryce Detroit grows intersectional, self-determined communities as culture director of Center for Community-Based Enterprises, C2BE. And then we have Halima Cassell, community advocate and mother of three. Halima Cassell exhibits widely and creates work that is exploratory, designing interactive installations and spaces for collaborative artistic expression, including projects that engender new ancient economy practices. Finally, we have Kennard Hockenhall, who is founder of the startup Bitbox, a Bitcoin exchange service. Kennard has been working on the Bitcoin blockchain cryptocurrency movement for the better part of a decade, and he is currently founding the Detroit Blockchain House. Yes. And I am Ingrid LaFleur. I am the, I'm an Afrofuturist, and also the chief community officer for EOS Detroit. EOS Detroit is the company that has put, th put this together this evening. We are a block producer candidate. And I'll get more into that in a, that gets a little complicated if you don't know about blockchain technology. Who, who here knows about blockchain technology? Okay, pretty savvy, sweet. So EOS is a new blockchain that launched June 10th. So Bitcoin has its own blockchain, Ethereum has its own blockchain, and so does EOS. And um, our mission at EOS Detroit is to be able to produce blocks so that then we can use those funds to work with grassroots organizations and co-create blockchain solutions with them. As the chief community officer, it's my job to teach about blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. But what I found in these past couple months, perhaps a conversation just on economies is really a good starting point for people to understand the intersection of finance and technology that exists with blockchain technology. So I really wanted to highlight some of these wonderful um, initiatives that I've been hearing for years, well, this one's newer, um, and, uh, and look at how these alternative economies or initiatives have, could possibly be supported by blockchain technology. So for those of you who don't know blockchain technology, it is basically a ledger that records all transactions that happen. So for instance, if I buy a painting with EOS coins um, and it has been verified and the gallery accepts those coins, that transaction is on that ledger. And they basically come in blocks. It is immutable and it is transparent, that means that anybody can go back and look at that transaction. So a good example that I just recently heard is like a Google Doc. And, I mean, yeah, a Google Doc. So anybody can uh, contribute to it because it's decentralized. You can see the contributions, but you can't make any changes. So it's similar to that kind of um, method. Blockchain technology is the technology under which cryptocurrency exists. And you can create smart contracts on a blockchain, 
which means that you can set all the parameters that you want and it will be a program that just runs on itself. And these smart contracts usually exist in code and now we have recording contracts that you can, that any, anybody in here can read if you don't know code. It just comes in regular English language or whatever language you use. Um, so that's just a little bit of background on blockchain technology. It might be a little confusing if you don't understand it completely, but I'm hoping to illustrate through these wonderful, um, com this wonderful conversation how blockchain can be inserted into something that already exists and that is already really supporting our communities. So I'll start with you, Anthony. I've been to one of your wonderful co <laughs> cooperative <laughs> economic um, conversations, and I and I love that you're you're working in cooperative economics. I believe cooperative economics is the the way to go, and I really love how blockchain technology can support that. Um, yeah. So if you can just tell us about your work and why you've decided to even go in this direction, because you're also an artist. Everyone, how are we doing? Hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Awesome. So my name is uh, B. Anthony Holly. Um, I am a native Detroiter, and coming back to the city, coming back to the city around 2012 for school, I just realized that there was a profound need for more cohesion amongst the various community projects that I knew were very valuable and it really shaped what self-sufficiency like for me and seeing just a community of artists that we know that uh, innovators that we know that I wasn't alone so that was like a very a very important kind of entryway for me back to this work. I began doing a lot of uh, consulting with small businesses and quickly start seeing trends that uh, we have a lot of the resources that we need and we can collaborate much better much more effectively so I really began to take it upon myself other young leaders and elders that were interested in basically supporting uh, particularly black businesses and getting them uh, uh, having a system where consumers would know where they can actually purchase their quality goods and services. And so that kind of launched me into learning about other ways to structure businesses. And one of the things that I landed on, one of the tools is cooperatives. Cooperatives are a way of organizing businesses that are, it's more just, it's more democratic, and uh, the people that are most impacted by the, or the organization or company are people that are making the decisions, so they're the members, the owners, and um, that was a very transformative approach, uh, and what I'll say is, uh, I mean, everybody, hopefully everybody knows uh, that we're in Detroit, and Detroit has a very complex history with dealing with uh, race, um, economy, and uh, the, the racial wealth gap. And so it was really important that I concentrate my efforts on the, the individuals that are most left out of the economy and acknowledge, first and foremost, that the economy is honestly not working for the vast majority of people in our country. And so uh, how do we, on the grassroots level, how do we people that are the everyday, uh, the everyday uh, people in the community neighborhood, how we're we creating systems and sharing pathways and strategies for them to be able to be self-determined, be self-sufficient, and ways for them to work together more closely. And so one of the organizations that I'm part of actually uh, helps to create businesses, uh, cooperative businesses and business businesses that are democratically owned, and that's the cooperation group. Because that wasn't enough. I mean, we actually needed support. We actually needed businesses that don't just need to exist. Anybody can write up some paperwork and say, I'm in business now. And maybe I need uh, expansion. Maybe I need uh, resources to grow my business. So we created, co founded, actually, this guy here uh, actually co founded a community loan fund that actually funds and lends non extractively to businesses that are cooperatives or are democratically. So um, basically what I want to instill right now is I'm, I'm kind of paint the picture that there's an ecosystem that exists and uh, technology plays a big part in how we tell that story and how we uh, connect the resources, connect the dots. And 
a lot of the work uh, revolves around asset mapping and being able to show where spatially, just um, geographically, spatially, where these businesses are, where these organizations are, where these uh, spaces that we want people to frequent, want people to know about. And my uh, large part of my role uh, through the Conscious Community Cooperative Think Tank has been in sharing a framework that we can connect these various uh, entities, whether it's uh, economics, education, energy, uh, energy production, uh, health, media, entertainment. These are various aspects of people's life that they, they deal with every day and creating systems that allow people to uh, be able to visually and be able to interact uh, is uh, one of the main goals and what I want to, I guess, want to share with us and Part of my hope that some of these technologies that are coming out allow us to be able to connect the people that most need the um, most need support in connecting and being self-sufficient. That these technologies are used to do that, used to amplify the voices, used to provide more inroads for uh, economic self-determination. So um, I'll say that for now, and I'm sure we'll have some more stuff to say later. Just to to give a little bit of stats. Detroit is 85% black, as we should know. I, in terms of the racial wealth gap, it would take 228 years for the average black family to accrue the wealth of the average white family if they stopped accruing wealth today. So when we're talking about financially and economically being at a disadvantage, you know, now you understand the disadvantage, 228 years, and now we're talking about a city, a complete, city whose people and population have been historically marginalized um, with it, working within this economic system. So this is why your work and everyone's work is just so incredibly important so that we can have more say and control over our own communities, um, especially by supporting businesses, small businesses that truly do work with our community. Um, can you, Bryce, also, when you talk, uh, expand a little bit on the co-op um, loan fund and how that works? Will do. Peace, everyone. Peace. How we doing? Peace. Good. Good. What's up? <clears throat> I am Bryce Detroit. In my capacity this evening, I'm speaking as culture director for Center for Community-Based Enterprise, which is a technical support organization in Detroit, a nonprofit that focuses on five core audiences, but in short, um, supporting those on the ground and coming together and creating enterprises that benefit self and community. And we have a lot of uh, metrics and all types of stuff to make sure that we're actually, that that means something on earth and it's not just rhetoric. Um, entered this work as an entertainment artist. So my identity with economic justice is coming from that point of professional career orientation. <clears throat> in particular, the first iteration of my career as a music producer um, was in a corporate music space. My skill set being identity and lifestyle branding, my responsibility was to create artists as corporate brand agents um, and then these artists essentially going out and selling products through product placement and name dropping in their entertainment content. The short story with that is this, um, I'm hyper aware of how, how products are slang. I'm super aware of how, cat, how corporations make money with new goods and services is through entertainment. They place these products there through this wide spectrum, attaching them to artists who have social capital and celebrity capital. And to that point, new consumer behaviors are influenced and informed. So for me, uh, because one of my values in terms of career is to have an entertainment career that is actually supported by 
an ecosystem that used to support entertainment enterprise and entertainment careers like in the 20th century. To come from a city where in my DNA, like my musical grandfathers, you know what I mean, were multi, were like worldwide music entrepreneurs in real life. The cut, not, not only the artistic and cultural content, but the economic activity that was coming out of black and brown people on a music entertainment level was rivaling the economic activity of the auto industry. So for that legacy, but for me to come from that legacy and then for me to be in the North End for the past, since 2009, be in the neighborhood where there are still these vestiges of that old music economy in the form of the Phelps Lounge, in the form of the Apex Bar. Uh, then it's, it's this joy for me to be able to support uh, a thriving m new music, cooperative music ecosystem because of this. Entertainment is how products are sold. If we have a thriving entertainment ecosystem, then we have a mechanism by which we can now sell and slang and influence new consumer behaviors for community-based enterprises new community goods, new community services. We have a lot of folks who have businesses, a lot of folks who have goods, yet are, is there an audience that is being influenced and inspired to want to purchase these new goods and services that are cooperatively made, that are providing community value? Maybe, maybe not. We have folks whose corporate career spaces is based on creating new consumer, new consumer influences and new consumer impressions around new goods. We got a lot of people who are using collaboration to come together in real self-determined ways. So that's one of the reasons why my entertainment career potentially intersects with cooperative economics, is to show how entertainment can support uh, the actual <laughs> sales side. Um, Ingrid wants me to talk a little bit about, I need to pass the mic too. You got to just let me know, cut me off. You know you got to cut me off sometimes. So I'll just go. So, uh, boom. The Detroit Community Wealth Fund. I'm going to talk about the Community Wealth Fund in terms of new technology. The reason I'm calling it a new technology is one, there is a significant population of people in Detroit uh, and a lot of other urban centers that have been um, through policy legislation historically marginalized from capital, from finance, from actually playing in economics and playing in capitalism on some real tip. For these people, we also have the added scenario where capital in terms of government dollars and subsidies going towards this corporation, which is now going to be in this neighborhood, and it might produce something in a process that produces all types of environmental injustice. That's a form of weaponized capital against people, people seeing dollars come into their community to push them out, people seeing dollars come into their community to support businesses that do not support them. So weaponized capital. So there's a lot of people who don't interact with finance, with capital for many different reasons. Plus we got the predatory lending thing. When you don't have financial literacy, then that creates a population of people who can be preyed upon financially. We know how that shit goes to prime market shit. Shout out 08. So from that standpoint, it, like my heart, as a finance major and all that, like my heart is like, yo, there are a number of us who have enterprises, but there are a number of us who are doing service-based work that needs to be sustainable. We need mechanisms to be able to finance and fund this work that historically is not fundable. So, let me go out here and research new ways of 
funding this kind of activity. So the Detroit Community Wealth Fund represents a new technology in that way because it is a patient loan fund. So coming from this whole social impact investing kind of framework, but it's rooted in grassroots, social justice, racial justice, politics, which we can't expand on more because it's two more people. But um, period, dot, dot, dot. Um, <laughs> so a couple of things about that. I, it would be great if maybe the fun worked within cryptocurrency, uh, simply because every single time you use a US dollar, the fiat currency, you're co-signing on a policy um, or on a co-signing government or corporate activities that you might not agree with, but a lot of things we don't agree with, right? But every single time you use a dollar, you're saying yes, it, like keep going. So, because you're in that current, the currency, uh, so it would, I think that that is a wonderful opportunity to think about how can cryptocurrency or another economic, you know, uh, currency slash blockchain technology system help to further support that loan fund so you can fully adhere to your ethics and values all the way through. Yeah. Eva. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, you all can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, awesome. So I want to start a little different. I'm going to put everybody in the room on the spot. I hope you don't mind. All right. <laughs> um, turn to somebody that you don't know and look at them. Stare at them in their eyes. I'm making everybody do it. Everybody's going to be uncomfortable. Find somebody that you don't know. <laughs> no, just look. Just look. Just look. <laughs> OK, and stop. <laughs> Clap once if you can hear me. Clap once. Clap twice if you can hear me. Now, the way that the conversation just popped off, I think some of y'all were cheating. I think you know each other and we're really happy to talk to each other. Did that happen? No. No? Okay, so here's the thing that I'm like delving into in my own life, right? We all have needs, we all have desires, we all have things that we do that are awesome. And if you give you know, half a moment to talk to somebody, you find something that you have in common. Or you find something that is worthy of further conversation. Or perhaps exchange, right? And the whole idea of economy is like meeting our needs. You know, we've been brought up to think that our principal <laughs> occupation is moving things around and collecting stuff and hoarding some type of currency. But really, it's about meeting needs, and one of them is like human interaction and feeding our physical needs as well as all of our other needs, which a main one is connection. Um, so I work professionally, I'll talk about later, but um, it kind of intertwines um, with my artwork um, in this way. I started a swap meet that's actually an art installation that has lots of artists doing things, making things, upcycling, um, expressing, but the admission is one item. And when you ask people to, that, tell them you can take whatever you want, as much as you want, for whomever you want, but all you have to do is bring one item, it changes the whole dynamic of the space, it changes the conversation, everybody can be entered into that space as someone who's a, a, giving, a giver, participant, and recognize like, wow, in our community, in our neighborhood, in our family, we have so much stuff, and this is so awesome. So that's one thing that I do, it's called the free market of Detroit. Um, another thing um, that I've worked on for several years is a time bank, where we trade hour for hour, but knowing that we have a pool of different skills. So if someone can come teach me how to use a circular saw, um, you know, I can trade that for hair braiding or babysitting. Um, and so I've learned of Simbi, which is a, a digital platform that helps facilitate that. But still, you know, it's, a lot of it is about building the trust and having the relationships with people to know that, like, I can count on you for the thing that you said you were going to do. Um, and so it's that blend of, I think, you know, having a digital platform really makes it a lot 
easier than like trying to call and say, hey, I'm gonna do this, or you know, or like those really analog things that we used to do. <laughs> but um, the, you can't have one without the other. Yeah, I feel like you have to have human interactions, and we often do that with potlucks. You know, you have to have those times and spaces where people can get together. Um, and also, I'm a part of the builder circle, so like, I don't know how to use the circular saw. And I'm really excited about that, um, because I was helping someone else out on their project. And we rotate houses, and they're all people that we know, but it's kind of like, if we don't have a need to talk about it, when do you bring that, those type of things out? When do you have the space to say, I, need, I would like to learn this, I'm doing this. You know, it's, it's when you create those opportunities. So um, I'll put a pin in it there, and I'll pass it on. Uh, I, I've always been a fan of your work, Halima. Uh, and one of the big reasons is because it exists outside of money completely, which means that your community can get what they need without worrying if they have $5 or even a dollar or 50 cents, right? Um, and that's like the best, best part of it because that is ultimately what we're all, you know, trying to figure out is how do we make sure communities are self-sufficient, um, are able to determine their own destinies, have their own power, right? And that is a, a, a huge source of power because you're existing completely out of the system by swapping and time baking and the builder circle. And time baking is on blockchain. There's a project that already does that, right? So this is Canard, just a quick bit. He's like <laughs> a blockchain genius who actually inspired me to learn more about blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. No pressure. Um, but I can't wait to hear more about the Detroit Blockchain House. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's a new initiative uh, to build an intentional building experience here in Detroit. Uh, and the idea uh, is basically sort of bring together the people who in this community have and even been, been most invested and in try to create uh, a living experience that reflects the value of the blockchain. And it also is exemplary in its, in its use of blockchain technology. Uh, so I think a big uh, goal of mine is, is seeing uh, more projects and more innovation uh, economies. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, one of the big things that we, that we want to do that's uh, in particular uh, an experience in new economy uh, is uh, equity of cool venting, where you recruit equity That we that we know uh, that we know uh, can be highly predatory and is in, in many ways uh, sort of structurally disadvantageous. Uh, so it's about moving um, past that paradigm and moving toward a paradigm of a greater alignment uh, where all the parties aligned, and then also uh, where the tenure of the land is reflective of the fact. Uh, that uh, much of the, the land around the world that are in this country is in not. I'm very excited about this project um, because with blockchain technology, it's new and it's emerging and it's all about experimentation and this will be like one huge project in Detroit where it's just full on experimentation. Uh, we have Detroit Blockchainers Meetup Group uh, some of you guys are from that meetup group, and it's the Detroit Blockchain House, and uh, Kennard is uh, the leader of the Detroit Blockchainers meetup group, um, and we facilitator, <laughs> guru, and so um, we have actually tonight, right now, <laughs> we have an exchange um, that happens every Tuesday at 7. Sorry. And then uh, every Wednesday we have a hackathon uh, at Red Door Digital. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, what are the next steps for you with the Detroit Blockchain House? Like, where are you with it? Yeah, I think uh, we've got a crew of people uh, who are already ready to move in. We're looking to find a house uh, in the greater downtown area, uh, hopefully with uh, a partner that is aligned uh, with the project. Uh, and from there, we can really start to kind of design the, the building experience. And we hope that, you know, in many ways, this can also be a facility for the whole community. Uh, it can be uh, an embassy, really, for uh, 
We're called Crypto Wonderland? Yeah, someone, someone else said it, not me. Um, yes, half my job is done. <laughs> that's great. Um, What are crypto nomads? So, uh, crypto nomadism is another sort of uh, new phenomenon that's emerged uh, where uh, you know, a lot of people who uh, variously have become crypto rich in many ways and they uh, sort of quit their jobs uh, and hit the road. There are a lot of these people travel through uh, Airbnb, but in particular, what some of these people do is they travel through the crypto community. The crypto community. Uh, a good example of Yeah, I was just talking to someone um, about uh, they traveled to a European country and they did not exchange actual fiat currency. Instead, they were just able to exchange, like, uh, I think just buy some cryptocurrency. So, which means that you're out of your, you don't have to deal with the exchange rate within the fiat, right? Um, and so then you could just do crypto and then you're just kind of like outside of that whole system and then it's easier to move around. Um, in that way. So I, that was the first time I heard it and I thought that that was really cool. I want to open it up to the audience if you have any questions. Hello, <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah, Kennard wants to say one last thing. Take something 
I just wanted to piggyback because it fits, veggie back, excuse me, because it fits so nicely. Um, <laughs> I was, um, I had the pleasure to be on a webinar with Vinay Gupta, who is one of the um, co-founders of Ethereum. And I asked the question and he put it so succinctly, he was like, you know, our structure today, our uh, capitalist model is a direct outgrowth of colonialism, which is a direct outgrowth of feudalism. And the only thing that we can say is that less people are dying right now than they were uh, several hundred years ago for folks to have what they want. Um, and that, that's like not a great, uh, not a great like bar, right? You know, to be meeting our needs, we're killing off a lot less people. And um, you know, one of the things with blockchain is that you can see the supply line, the supply chain. So, you know, I think you mentioned earlier, Ingrid, that the wealth gap could be closed in 228 years, something like that, if white people stopped earning, accruing wealth. That kind of coincides with the history of enslavement in this country. And we have to be mindful that people are still enslaved all over the world for us to have the things that we have. So if we can look at the supply chain and say, okay, well, I prefer my cell phone batteries not be mined by seven-year-olds, we have now that much more power to make a choice as a consumer. So I just wanted to put that out there. My name is Cheryl, and excuse me, on a free press about two and a half months or maybe even less, there was an article about a Bitcoin and um, that was a late tag. Could you, if you are, can you talk about that, or can you just kind of expand on what kind of access that now is? Uh, yeah, well, since I kind of prompted that article in my Facebook post, <laughs> I'll give some context. Uh, I have been seeing ATMs and liquor stores in our neighborhoods, the Bitcoin ATMs, um, and I was just really curious about it, like, oh, does that mean that the hood knows about Bitcoin and, like, they're, like, savvy on blockchain technology and cryptocurrency? Not necessarily. Um, and I came to find out that there's a lot of fees that are associated with um, using those um, ATMs. So it's really for someone who might not fully understand the whole ecosystem um, of cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin. But all the same, they're everywhere. Uh, and, and so I, I posted it at like, has anyone seen this? And then my girlfriend was talking about in Brooklyn in the laundromat, all lower income neighborhoods. Uh, there's a, a Bitcoin ATM, and I, I find it interesting that they're like kind of targeting these particular areas um, where financial literacy might be low, digital literacy might be low. Um, it's just like taking advantage. Can I be Money than necessary in order to 
does not know the other processes that are, are available to you quite easily um, to acquire Bitcoin or to exchange it. The legal level where there is a legal issue. It's not a legal issue, not at all. It's just like going to an ATM, sometimes you pay $4 for a transaction, sometimes you pay $2. Okay. So it's that kind of situation. It's not illegal, it's just capitalism, so. Thank you. 
freedom. I mean, uh, liberation uh, is the first thing that always comes to my mind when everybody, anybody asks it. I think the way that it looks is going to vary. So here we're talking about um, talking about new future, new power, new economies. So I think about what does power mean to me? And I think that that's something that I encourage everybody to interrogate amongst themselves. For me, I go to the, literally the definition to be able to speak something and have it act for you, be able to uh, be self-determined and use these tools, these uh, technologies as, as Bryce uplifted we are practicing many different um, ways of being that we consider technology. So whether that's, whether that's um, the community lending model where we are not, where we're not, uh, where, where we can lend you money, lend your business money to be able to expand and work with you and partner that with technical assistance so that you're not uh, on the hook by yourself. We're actually partnering with you if something should happen, God forbid, um, we're not coming after your first form, we're not coming after your home, your car. That's that's the type of future that we want to see. We want to see a future that is inclusive, a future that is uh, non-extractive. And the more things that we can do in our communities that are aligned with the just transition or the, the solidarity economy, in many different ways to talk about it. Um, but I encourage everyone to Look up Solidarity Economy if you're not already familiar with it. It's a whole world of uh, interactions, ways to looking at our economy differently. And so speaking specifically, um, I want to see, I want to see uh, financial self-determination in the sense that how can we use these, you know, what the, how can we use these technologies to become more resilient and be able to as we know, and I hope everyone knows this, but if you didn't know, I'm going to tell you that all empires that have ever existed, they have, they, have, they have collapsed. And this, this economy is on the same trajectory, fast. And um, I know NASDAQ and the news will tell you a different story this day and the next day. Uh, but I want my community to be resilient for when the economy take a turn and make the shift. So practicing the new, we call them new economies, but it's really modern days, ancient ways. So uh, people that are, uh, mostly people that are indigenous are, have the, the spirit within them or the memory or the experience via their elders to remember that this stuff is new. Being able to circulate resources and take care of ourselves outside of someone else outside imposing the structure upon us. It's not new. Um, it's something that we need to re, re, uh, reimagine and uplift and practice. And so my hope is that these technologies um, are, are used to augment and to take uh, power analysis to the next level, to take uh, how we are imagining our businesses working together and sharing those resources. These, um, we talk about uh, community business books these, you know, some communities, some businesses have these cars where you go to different businesses and swipe. What's the future of that? I think that there's a lot of applications. Uh, the caution is keeping the original intention in mind. So making sure that the people that are being involved know that the intention is to make that transition. The intention isn't just to make a quick flip. Oh, I made some money because Bitcoin is up today. I'm going to sell it all. You know, that's short sighted. We're looking at the future, we're looking beyond, we're looking at what is, like, what is the future? What is the world that we really want to see? And it cannot just be having more things. And so the last thing I want to say is, um, I talked about power mapping analysis. I really do see this uh, overlapping so many different ways with resiliency and self-sufficiency as it relates to an initiative that we have called Get Ready Theory. And so we talked about the overlap of uh, whether it's uh, time making, whether that's uh, some of the things that Helena has already shared, the, um, the skill sharing, all these things that sometimes 
we want to just completely live outside of technology. And I'm coming to the, <laughs> slowly coming to the reality that that's not really gonna happen. We're gonna be, at least there's gonna be a long transition that we're going to be dealing with technology and ways to, to augment and support ourselves um, with food. So yeah, my, my, the future that I want to see is one where the people that are most in need of this resource have, uh, are put in the forefront, put in the forefront and that uh, the intention is, is very clear. And so, um, one more thing I will ask, as far as the history, because we I think we were supposed to talk somewhat about the context, but if you have not e ever seen um, the laws of this country laid out, there's a very, uh, very awesome video that's about five minutes. It's titled, A Brief History of White Privilege. And I was like, well, I'm not watching that. But A Brief History of White Privilege, and it really goes through the origin of this country, probably started in the 1800s, starts from the 1800s, and really chronicles all of the legislation that led up to uh, where we are today, and all the legislation that codifies the economic uh, disparity. So we, it didn't just happen this 200, almost 300 year wealth gap, it didn't just happen. All of these, the, you know, whether it's the Indian Removal Act, whether it's the Slave Code, whether it's the Plessy versus Ferguson, all of these things added up and they had an economic aspect. It wasn't just a law. This was something that people that were in power, mostly white people at the time, were going to benefit from. You know, I don't know if people knew that, that um, the first reparations were given to white people for lost slaves, lost property. And I'm gonna just let that sink in. That there is, there, is, there is a gap, there's a harm that has been done to our community. And so when we look at these opportunities, this new thing, this new trend, you know, we need to see through it for more than that. We need to see through it. What can we do in our own self, in our own community to, to uh, support the repair, repairing the harm that has been done and so I'm, my hope is that these new ideas, these new technologies, these new ways of being um, come and practice more, uh, more locally and are focused very deliberately on righting the wrongs of history, being on the right side of history. It sounds like there needs to be almost like a shift in consciousness. That's what I talk about. Like I'm in the business of shifting consciousness, shifting our relationship to money and, uh, and the economy. But even um, as we like try to develop these like community currencies, for instance, if people are still in this kind of colonized mind where they want to make that flip and always make money in fiat currency, then it doesn't work very well, right? So it has to be people who really, really understand. It's like a radical assessment of values needs to happen, so that people understand that this community currency is really supposed to support the community and its local ecosystem um, outside of this current um, economic model that's only producing harm and violence, um, just based on exploitation. Uh, for another resource uh, on cooperative economics, there is Collective Courage, the history of African American um, cooperative economic practice and thought. Uh, Collective Courage, definitely check it out. It is a really, really awesome book. It even um, talks about how W.E.B. Du Bois was doing research on cooperative economics, and I think in the early 1900s, there were like over 150 cooperatives um, that were functioning. No, actually it was the 1800s. Um, over 100 plus cooperatives, black cooperatives were functioning and very successful. So this is a long, long legacy, as you said, modern days, ancient, wait, did you say modern? Ancient ways, modern days. Oh, ancient ways, modern days. <laughs> Love that. Uh, so do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, I just want to ask one question. So first, I those 
that use U.S. currency will see the momentum and the hugeness of the Bitcoin, they're just going to switch over to this. My thing is, like this young man said, is to change the consciousness of it and be self-sufficient. And this is basically how black people survive. I mean, it was a, a matter of what do you have in your resources that another person needs within your community. So there was always an exchange going on. It was never uh, to the point where how can I have a kind of exchange where you're going back to a modern, a, a slave kind of mentality, like I've got a slave master and I'm thinking of how am I gonna make gain off of you. Is, is that gonna happen with the momentum of the Bitcoin craze? Those same people that are in the US, they're just gonna switch over. How are we going to prevent that and to make it so that the kind of community that you say you want to build, how are you going to know if somebody really, you know, for this movement and for the purpose of that movement? Because absolute power corrupts. And when we get to the point where you want to alleviate all other areas, we all into this new technology, you lose your human contact system that check in and say, hey, you know, I'm giving you this. I don't want anything. And as we move with such a rapid pace because it's happening so fast, how are we going to prevent that? Yeah, I, I would love for Bryce to, to handle this question. Since, uh, because it does require this level of marketing and, and education combined, I think, to shift that consciousness. So first, I do want to root it in culture, which is, to me, the identity, and then the subsequent behavior that that identity produces. Bernard named it, you just spoke to it, Anthony spoke to it, Ingrid spoke to it. Major aspect of the blockchain technology conversation in Detroit is from a social movement perspective. Blockchain as a justice, as a way of actually achieving economic justice. So from that standpoint, uh, for me, this is a question that still must be asked and put in the forefront of the movement right now. What is the way to really get to widespread adoption? If we just want to pinpoint it there. Widespread adoption on a movement value principle level, as well as widespread adoption on an actual economic level to the point where, and, for, and just to note, Let's take economics outside of the narrow box of capitalism. Because outside of capitalism, economics means all resources and the way that they are exchanged to produce the quality of life, period. So from an economic standpoint, widespread adoption to where, like for me, HTML was like super household. BASIC was the first coding language that got introduced to it 11 years old. BASIC, but everybody knew BASIC at a certain time, the same way that early 2000s, everybody knew HTML on some level, at least heard HTML as an acronym. Getting it to a level where young people grow up with it on a technology level as well as a social ethic level this is, this is me really acknowledging, though, that this is the time that we're in right now in Detroit. In, on the clock of the world, we are in a time of a real transition. There are early adopters on some marketing tip, you know what I mean? And Kennard, for sure, is an early adopter. We got folks like Onyx. We got folks like at the blockchain meetups. If you come to those, the rear door, and you will see the early adopters. Yet, we're still in that space. There's a world full of early adopters it may seem like a lot of people on the investment side are playing in crypto, on the consumer side, but it's still very early. It's so early the US government is still trying to get a hold on 
it and, and even trying to define what it means for it for the for the government standpoint. So I'm just wanting us all to really be present in what's happening right now will create the potential for our long term, whatever those respective and collective long terms are. But right now we are for real in this beginning on a for real Detroit cultural, like what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? What is the way that the conversation, because right now this is the way the conversations are being had. If you've come to a blockchain meetup, if you um, went to any of the co-creation sessions that Ingrid did during her mayoral campaign, the conversation, if you, shit, if you saw what she did earlier at some presentation, the point is the conversations are still happening in this heady technological space, and even that is evidence that it hasn't come here yet. Like it hasn't come down yet, it's still coming down, people are still trying to figure out the way to even bring the conversation to folks. So this is literally the time and space that we're all in. And everybody informing like, well shit, nothing you said makes sense. Great, <laughs> feedback, you know what I mean? And we take that and then we can ask deeper questions. What parts, what are the different kind of languages? What are the audiences that we really want to hit right now? Because we don't just want to hit, quote unquote, the academicians or quote unquote, the technologists. We, there are early adopters amongst multiple population segments. We got cats, right? It will blow some of our minds how many cats that you would qualify as like street or hood are dealing in black market internet shit. I'm talking about they know internet better than the majority of people on earth and they may not have graduated from high school, but they make it all kind of economy for self and others. Using these type of technologies in ways that the average consumer is not even hip to, won't even get hip to until it's like a 2020 expose 15 years from now. In 2018, you know what I'm saying? Like, so all that to say, this is the beginning. And we're all participating in creating the culture, the education culture, the political culture, and the economic culture. And just to own that. Let's own that moment, because that's the power in it. Just to veggie back off of that, um, I think it's going to require, and I'm probably the person who unapologetically knows the least about blockchain on this panel. Um, just knowing what it takes to get stuff done, it's going to take some champions or uh, experts that are, um, and with the right framing, with the right narrative to be able to get that out. So being unapologetic about what um, you laid out, uh, Kennard, like this, the underpinnings, but how, how can that be more in the forefront so that people can say, hmm, blockchain, hmm, cryptocurrency, that is me. Because right now, the, you know, people are like, I heard of that, but are they saying, is that me? Is that saying, or is that a, that's a white folk thing, or that's a rich folk thing, or that's a, this person, whoever, not me, that not me, whoever that entity is. So I would say, um, you know, getting the, getting the message really clear and putting the invitation out and um, getting, I mean, getting some, getting some, uh, some strong young leaders on, on par with, uh, you know, getting the message out and making sure first and foremost that, um, that, it's, that it's sound, that you can stand by the integrity that you're, you're advocating for and that, um, you know, that there has been due, due diligence done so that we can actually say with confidence that, hey, this is a real, legit, grassroots strategy the way we're doing, right? Other people are gonna do their thing and people are always gonna do their thing. So I just add that yeah, into I, the conversation. Um, I was just gonna say that uh, it is also one of the things that I'm, of course, focused on. I want Detroit to be the first major city in the U.S. to have widespread adoption. Uh, and so as, as we start, um, this is, for instance, this is the first uh, monthly talks that we're having, uh, EOS Detroit is having, so every month we're going to have a talk, um, and we're going to have other kinds of events, but we also um, are starting workshops, 
And these workshops are literally, I, I envision them happening in your home, in your living room, in the kitchen, or wherever. Just a very comfortable, intimate setting where we can start the process of um, educating people about blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. And we're hoping out of that will be more people who will do it and, and that will just like fractal out uh, where we're educating people. But if you're interested in a workshop, which is completely free, um, in your community, in your home, please let me know and we'll come to you and we will teach whomever, whenever, however. Okay. Oh. Okay, I'm just, I'll be really brief. I'm just gonna say, I'm a nerd, I love workshops, I love documentaries. <laughs> From her face, all these people under me do not. We gotta, we gotta do something that makes a low bar to entry and it's fun and includes selfies. <laughs> if you can win something in cryptocurrency by taking selfies, my oldest daughter will already, you know, have, yeah, she'd be with me. <laughs> so, you know, we gotta think about like, what are the strategies for folks like us in this room, and then also for the people who are like coming up under us? Well, I just wanna say, like, I think we should do both. Because my, my goal is to have people through these workshops actually get interested and hopefully want to go deeper and innovate and actually participate. There are parts of the governance that I need people to be part participating in. Um, and so therefore, like a full deep understanding is really necessary at this stage of the game. Um, just so you know, like that's my, my goal. I need more, more blockchain engineers and developers who are women and who are black, and of color, uh, more than anything. So if we can like inspire more people, I think it's really, really important. So, and I think those are absolutely, definitely legitimate concerns. Um, and uh, I think the, the real answer is education. Uh, and one thing I've heard is that uh, if you want to liberate uh, people, uh, Senator Arby, if you want them to stay free, build schools. Uh, so, uh, going back to that idea of censorship uh, resistance uh, and advancement uh, and censorship resistant technology. Uh, another precedent for this is printing press. Uh, so uh, the person who took uh, most advantage of this had a top in, in Europe. Uh, was Martin Luther who leveraged the printing industry in Luther and was able to get his message out uh, before he could be attacked. Uh, and that that uh, that uh, opportunity, that technological opportunity, was what allowed uh, the Reformation. But Martin Luther also wrote things uh, that uh, provided, in many ways, uh, the fodder for us uh, the Nazis. So this technology, um, the way I explain it today, is a sword. A sword can be used by a good guy to do a lot of good. A sword can be used by a bad guy to do a lot of bad. But if you put the, the, the sword uh, in the hands of baby, baby can look the sword off. So the first thing uh, is to train the organs. Uh, the real goal is for you to make the story into your own things. Uh, so I think you do that through education, but I think it's through uh, it's it's through education that is actually effective. Uh, and I think the type of that education that, that is most effective, that is most powerful and meaningful for uh, the learner is bottom-up education where you are learning actually from the foundations. So just out of curiosity, um, raise your hand if, you're if you take it in Econ, Econ 101. Okay, so we got a good number of people in this room, but we also got a good number of people who are not taking uh, what's considered to be a foundation, of course. Uh, of course, uh, there, there's all sorts of uh, room for uh, reworking the foundation, but I mean, if you're looking to learn about this technology, I strongly encourage you to uh, go deep um, and to, to gain a deep understanding. Uh, I think uh, two things uh, that can kind of uh, be uh, signposts for you in order to, to know you're, you're in the right direction on 
making it so that uh, you can uh, you can interact economically, uh, traditionally. And so, in part, what that means is that uh, a tax uh, then you really have the longer to do uh, you are you are protected from previous uh, technology. Um, a great example, uh, there's so many examples, but uh, some of you in the room will know what happened to Black Wall Street. Um, uh, and they, uh, the financial uh, center uh, uh, of the, the, the black community uh, of the whole country was burned uh, to the ground by a mob. Uh, and uh, a lot of what this technology is about is, is, is protecting you from those sorts of attacks. But the first step is actually becoming aware of your vulnerability, aware of the attacks that you were already vulnerable to, aware of the attacks that were already happening without you knowing about them. Uh, and the actual cryptography is the key to, to developing that awareness, and I think it's actually the key in many ways to the, to the shift in the Kennard does really great presentations on blockchain technology as well. social justice communities, being around so many people who have um, these negative perspectives, negative orientations with capital because of how it was weaponized against them, then that created this, this, this schism where 
I began to hide the fact that I actually came from finance and, and have a corp came from corporate entertainment and had this entire thinking and perspective that I think is supportive of sustainability of our movements. So hiding an aspect of oneself for years, that creates trauma. It's been through me coming in contact with uh, impact, investing, that entire world, and then being able to create a community wealth fund where I've actually been able to heal in the way of expressing this point of repressed identity. I need to let this shit out. Because me letting out my, fi my love for finance and capital in a real healthy way is allowing me to be a bridge and a point of access to resources. There are a lot of people who we're in contact with through our work every day um, who outside of commerce are rooted in doing service-based work. The opportunity for this heart-led work to actually be sustainable so that you don't have, so that people who are really like, all ten toes in and being of value to other people directly, so they don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about fundraising. They don't have to spend a lot of time learning the nonprofit industrial complex world from which philanthropy and grants exist. So, in these conversations about technology that can produce new economies, in that creates opportunities for many of us to heal past many different points of, of trauma that come from economic and financial circumstances. I mean, hopefully that was like somewhat clear. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be rhetorical at all. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I jump in too? Um, so I think, again, marrying the two, the ancient and the new, um, literally being able to transact with someone in a different, in a different form. So. Um, I've used a, a digital currency to get massage, you know, and I've seen a circle of um, wellness practitioners be able to um, offer services for time, for time doing other things that they need in their personal lives. So I think it's super important and like the revolution should feel good. Getting our freedom should be awesome. It's amazing, and our bodies should all also feel that, and we should be nourished and have all the things that we need. So I, I definitely think that you know it's all a part, and blockchain could be like a, a, a way that those folks who are often in service and healing work get to start, you know, their portfolio of digital currency. Awesome. Hi, guys. Okay. Just really, really quick. So. Thank you, great question. Um, one thing I'll just add, because these two pretty much said everything else, is that um, really looking at uh, our economy or what it is and thinking about when we're, when we're looking to support uh, or create something, think asking the question, what need are we addressing? Like a lot of times, there will be things that come up that are not, they're not really a, uh, necessarily, a, well, let me say this. My focus has been on the parts of our economy that are needs-based. So mapping out our economy based on land, based on food, based on water, based on energy, based on education. And so, uh, as Halima alluded to, a lot of times there's healing work that needs to happen. And so there's a lot of unpacking of there's a lot of unpacking of um, like what our new roles in, like whether you're a white cisgender person, whether you're a black heterosexual, whatever, 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 what, what is it that you can do from your point of identity to, to support the collective repairing? And that for me has looked like energy alignment work, healing through, uh, healing through listening to people, connecting them with gypsums and verbs and uh, connecting with other healers, connecting with music. So like supporting supporting the, the collective of uh, healers that are in our communities. A lot of them don't even see themselves as healers. But there is, I mean, a lot, a lot of times when we're trying to support them, they're like, I have to, this is like my thing, I can't, I can't get paid to do it. And a lot of times I think that that 
puts them at a puts us because I'm now identifying self identifying as a healer that puts us as a at a disadvantage and I think that having as Saluma said uh, another other opportunities and avenues to uh, support each other uh, will have an impact or can have an impact on that that relationship so allowing the healers to be able to maybe I don't want cash maybe we can we can exchange it some other way we can exchange and all these different ways that are alternative to the economy. And uh, yeah, so I, I really appreciate your question and I think that that's a question that's not brought up enough. How do we, this is a thing and it's cool and it's sexy and it's trending. How do we get, how do we shift our minds and our consciousness to be able to get to a point, and a lot of times that means navigating through baggage that, that uh, is not sexy to talk about, it's not cool but we have to do it. Like, why is this even necessary? Why is this, like, why is blockchain even a thing that's being uplifted at this point? Because there's healing work that needs to be done. Well, it needs to be done regardless, uh, regardless of things that we're I think it's important to understand that it's decentralized, which means that even if you knock out one person, it's still going to keep going because it's the collective and that's where the power is. It doesn't rely on just one person. Um, and then at, with the Black Wall Street um, example, you can bomb us, but that information will still be on that blockchain. Uh, and you know, so since everything is protected within this one space, then in terms of destabilization, it will be much more difficult, but possible, but difficult. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a phrase that's a part of the lingo, uh, it's called single point of failure. Don't make your, your leaders in a single point of failure. Um, this is something I um, say all the time. People who are a part of this community know it's true. Uh, um, so I think just as Ingrid said, um, we are working with the career value, uh, and that means that there won't be any single one leader, any single node uh, to attack uh, or to take out. Um, and that's, that's fundamental to what this is. Uh, and the way I sort of think about it, um, and it aims to sort of instill in people is the notion that you know, what we have is a, a peer to peer community. What we're used to is a client server community, which is quite different. Um, community in a way almost this, this doesn't make sense. It's not for you. It's not for you. Uh, whereas uh, 
interested in general about cooperative economics, we're all coming together to think about the, the culture, the social, political, um, as well as the communal. So definitely going to say that. Um, we'll also shout out Center for Community-Based Enterprise, c2be.org. If anyone in here is acting as more than one person. Like if it's two of you, if it's at least two of you, and you are rooted in enterprises that create community specific neighborhood community benefit, then C2BE is an organization that can potentially support you starting or scaling that kind of operation. So uh, boom. Peace everybody. Um, so, a lot of what he said. Um, so, sharing just like updates, things that, things that are coming up. So, what he said about Detroit Community Wealth Fund, um, if there's something that you're, if you know of people that are rooted in community that have a business that is either seeking to be cooperatively owned and managed or is currently pursuing a, a democratic structure, which means there's not one person at the top making all the decisions, and it, there is a more of a, uh, a unified approach to uh, running the business. And you are in, they are in need of, uh, whether that's looking for expansion, looking to grow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can be a resource for that. Um, we particularly are interested in uh, community-based businesses that are um, inherently owned by people of color, uh, live in Detroit, and it's awesome. Nope. Um, so that's the Detroit Community Wealth Fund, the Detroit Community Wealth Fund. Um, and I have a lot of plugs for people of color. And if you are a person of color that is interested in self-sufficiency and uh, sees yourself as some type of service provider or some type of person that's just interested in uh, liberation, co-liberation, uh, various aspects of whether it's uh, whether it's emergency preparedness, uh, economic self-sufficiency, health, uh, I invite you, if you're interested, we have a think tank, we meet every third Thursday uh, from 7 to 8.30, it's called the Conscious Community Cooperative Think Tank. Um, please reach out to me We're on Facebook, or also you can just see me afterwards if you're interested um, in basically establishing solutions for self-sufficiency for people of African descent connecting that with other partners that we have nationally that are uh, working on creating liberated zones as well. Thank you. Um, let's do
the August 25th in the North End on Oakland and Euclid. Euclid is the healing. Uh, it's all day, 12 to 8, community arts. Uh, we'll have a book giveaway, swap, good food, music, spaces for people to share and connect. Um, that's Saturday, August 25th. Um, and I just want to shout out peopleshub.org. Um, if you're interested in peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, online workshops around myriad of topics, then hopefully cryptocurrency can be coming up soon. Um, just check us out. Okay. Um, yeah, last thing I would say is just that this is very much uh, uh, moving past the paradigm of sacrifice. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be sacrifice, but uh, if we figure this out, if we pull this off, that means that we will be achieving wealth in the markets. Um, that's being absolutely it. To, um, so uh, the choice architecture that we are, are still trained in, where we have to trade off uh, between uh, pursuing the advancement of rights and pursuing material well-being, this is actually how uh, the way ourselves from that choice architecture, where we can, uh, where we are empowered to create and transmit value and consistency with our value. Uh, so that's what we're excited about. Yes, so you can find out more information about his workshop on EOS Detroit's Facebook page. Uh, that's EOS Detroit. Um, also, the Detroit Blockchainers Meetup. Just find us on the Meetup um, website, Detroit Blockchainers. Become a member, of course it's free. And then you'll know about all of the different things that are happening in our blockchain community. Uh, EOS Detroit is having a talk next week, August 7th. Um, we are having someone, a guest, speak about the EOS governance. EOS is, uh, as I said, a new blockchain, and it's unique in that it, there is a constitution attached to it. So it's the first governed blockchain um, that requires token holders, before you can acquire a token, uh, to sign a constitution. And that constitution was created by token holders, can be ratified by token holders. And this is why I want more people involved so that the ratification reflects diverse perspectives, ideas, knowledge bases. Um, one of the first lines of the, the constitution is that the token cannot be used to cre uh, create any harm or violence. So uh, just to give you an idea, and then it can get kind of technical after that, but um, just to give you an idea, that, that EOS uh, has this ethics and values attached to it, and that's what attracted me to the EOS blockchain. Uh, we will also have another talk on April 21st at Red Door Digital. Um, I'll be in conversation with Kwaku Ose. He created um, a cooperative financial fund, uh, a really interesting project, and he's very much involved in blockchain technology, so we get to kind of dive deep again about cooperatives and um, blockchain technology um, more on April 21st. Sorry, August. So me and time is a, is a thing. So August 21st and August 7th is the talk about EOS governance. Um, I definitely want you to also, is, is Asia here? Or is there a sign up book for the gallery? Yeah. Uh, okay, I really want you guys to get on the email list for the galleries. This is an amazing gallery. Please support, buy some artwork. I don't know if they're accepting crypto yet, but I'm working on it. And please um, sign our email list if you haven't, it's on the table right here, um, so that you can get updates about EOS Detroit, about blockchain, about EOS itself, and all of our events. Thank you so, so much for coming out. I wanna just uh, thank Adam and the EOS team. Raise your hand, EOS. Where are you guys? The 
EOS Detroit team is here. Thank you guys for your support. Um, and thank you for coming. Have a good night. <laughs>